Welcome to the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh's Case Notes podcast. Over the next few months, we're going to work our way around the body head to toe, exploring different body parts and organs and their history in a cultural, medical, social sense. We're going to hear from a historian or curator about their work studying these body parts and their history. And we'll finish up each episode by exploring some of the recipes that were developed in history to treat that part of the body. Welcome to Head to Toe as we move around the body. My name is Daisy Cunningham and I am the College's Heritage Manager. My name's Olivia Howarth and I'm a volunteer with the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh Heritage. And we have made it as far today as the muscles. Now, I have really got overexcited about exercise and the history of exercise. Before I burrow down into this rabbit hole. Do you have anything that's not exercise? <laughs> what, what have you found, Olivia? I've got a really interesting fact about the word muscle. There was a Scottish physician called John Moyer who published his university notes in 1620. And he wrote that muscle is so called either because of a similarity to the shellfish or because it resembles a skinned mouse. Initially, I was like, that couldn't possibly be why they're called muscles. But uh, the word muscle was first used in Middle French in the 14th century, and it evolved from the existing Latin word mus or musculus, which mean mouse or little mouse. Ancient Romans thought that muscles looked like mice, particularly the bicep muscle. Yeah, okay. Little mice running around the body. Yeah. So I'm glad we, we, we're we starting from a point where we know what a muscle is. It's a bit like a, a skinned mouse. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So muscles here, particularly in the context of exercise. Exercise is part of humoral theory. So the basic understanding of how medicine and the body work dating back to, to ancient Greece. Exercise is one of the, the processes within humoral theory that's called a non-natural. So this is one of the ways that the body is maintained in balance. So there's a list of different things that you can do to maintain your humoral balance. Exercise is one of those things. And it's talked about, you know, way, way back with the earliest sort of known physicians, Galen and Hippocrates. And as with anything to do with humoral theory, it is pretty needlessly complicated to make it sound much more technical than it is. So Galen broke it down into different types of exercise. There's slow exercise, there's vigorous, gentle, violent, all these different things. And the different categories of exercise treated different types of complaints. So whether you should jump up and down on the spot or you should lift weights or you should throw a ball around would depend on your humoral balance. I want to know what violent exercise is. I can't remember, but I do know that there is sort of combat exercise on his list. So we're thinking like Um, wrestling and boxing. So I wonder if that was the stuff that was violent. That makes more sense. I did read that it was possibly Hippocrates' teacher. I say possibly because he may have been Hippocrates' teacher. Herodicus, who kind of initiated this idea that exercise was good, not just as a treatment, but to maintain your health. And it was in part because he was a physician and a gymnastics master. So the gymnasium in ancient Greece was quite a protected space. And as a gymnastics master, he would have had access to that space. And he had different regimens of gymnastics and exercise for different treatments. What you're saying as well, though, is what's so interesting about the history of exercise, because a big chunk of history of medicine is about treating diseases. But exercise is, of course, often used as a preventative. So that's the kind of other, really other aspect of medicine and health that can be much harder to find evidence of, is when people are doing things not to treat a disease that they have, but to stop diseases from occurring in the first place. There's um, 
this fantastic Renaissance guy, Mercurialis, who wrote a book called De Arte Gymnastica, which is it's sort of a veneration of ancient Greece and Rome. It's a really fantastic book. We have it in our collections and um, it's full of illustrations. It's almost like a fantasy because it's written so long after, but it's trying to replicate what they were doing in ancient Greece without 100% really knowing. So there's a slight fantasy element to it of, you know, kind of the heroic, beautiful men. But it's really talking about physical therapy and sort of sports medicine, I guess, you know, as we would think of it now. It's not vanity exercising. It's not about trying to look a certain way. It's about being physically well in the broader sense. Sticking with the theme of exercise, um, one of the aspects of it that I kind of find particularly fascinating when looking into it recently for this podcast has been the relationship between women and exercise in history. Into the 1700s, we have a, a big collection of letters from and to a president of our college, William Cullen, and he was mostly prescribing for very high-status, wealthy people. And he would frequently prescribe exercise. But again, it's this very class-based exercise. Awful lot of horseback riding, some dancing. Um, but again, you know, he's not going to tell anyone to go for a run. <laughs> There's not going to be jogging involved. Mm. So mostly horseback riding. And again, it's very gendered as well. So what is acceptable for a woman to do? There's a lot written about how women are too delicate for various forms of exercise. But of course, they're also very restricted by their clothing. It's not like they can take off their corset or their voluminous underskirts to do exercise. That would be far too societally unacceptable. The usual caveat, as always, is we are talking about wealthy women. I think we can probably assume that women who aren't wealthy are getting a lot of exercise just through having a job, living their lives, surviving. Um, so yeah, when we're talking about women and exercise, at least up until the 20th century, we are very specifically talking about middle or upper class women. So in 1830s, you have the calisthenics movement, which kicks off in Europe. But basically what I hadn't realised is calisthenics is literally just a word for women's gymnastics. What it does is it takes aspects of gymnastics as it already existed. It selects those ones that can be done at home because you do not want to be going to a gymnasium if you're a woman. But it also exercises what are described as feminine muscles, which are essentially those muscles that will not give you big visible muscles. So this is kind of you exercise, but you're exercising the discrete lady muscles, basically keeping a very particular physique that is viewed as being a womanly physique. And because there's so much writing about this by so many different people, a lot of it contradicts itself. There are plenty of arguments as to what terrible things would happen if you didn't exercise enough and arguments about the terrible things that would happen if you exercise too much. So it's a very, very fine line that you're walking. Because if you don't exercise, you'll have nervous disorders. You'll possibly become hysterical. You'll have bad posture. If you exercise too much, your organs will be deformed. Your skin will be ruined. You will become wrinkled and haggard. I'm going to put my period drama brain on now. There is a point in Pride and Prejudice where Elizabeth Bennet walks to Netherfield. And this is deemed as shocking by Mr Bingley's sister because she walked alone. She was covered in mud, but also it ruined her complexion. Out there, there will always be a <laughs> critic. So, um, But I think it's to an extent in the, the earlier period, the sort of Georgian period. But really, again, as is so often the case, it all comes to a sort of height in the Victorian period. And we have the German book by a guy called Gustav Zander. And his gimmick, his idea, was these fantastic exercise machines that he developed for exercise in the home. And they look like what I guess nowadays possibly would be described as steampunk. They are leather, they are brass, they are these incredibly ornate with, with wheels and pulleys and bits you twirl and things like that. But all of the people pictured using them are dressed in three-piece suits. So it's sort of, yes, of course, you'll exercise your own home, but you'll put on your finest gown in order to do so. <laughs> and there's a British one that's a bit similar. It's called British Manly Exercises. All very gendered, all very, you know, this is the book that you get if you want to be manly. And, you know, there's this other book if you want to be 
womanlike. And again, as with many things in this sort of period, it gets quite tied into ideas of the perfect body, being healthy, civic pride. It gets tied in with colonialism. It gets tied in with militarism. And like we talked about, I think, in when we were talking about the ear and deafness, you know, there's, there's a very specific sort of model of person you're trying to be. And it's at this time they start en masse this very structured exercise. My favourite aspect of this is when we get to Edinburgh itself. There was this institution called the Royal Patent Gymnasium, which was vast. So it was quite, you know, it was, it was increasingly common to have these public gymnasiums where people would go and exercise. Particularly if you were male, you would often go to these places to exercise together. And the Royal Pain Gymnasium was the biggest of its kind in Scotland. And I saw various adverts for it. It feels like they must be lying in these adverts because one of the things it said was there was a seesaw that would elevate you 50 feet in the air. It was 100 feet long. There was another one that said there was a rowing machine that could seat 600 people. It, it, the size that we're talking about is just crazy. Why would you want 600 people on a rowing machine? I don't know. And, and it did say that there was also a sort of indoor gymnasium as part of this giant outdoor gymnasium. So maybe the, the giant stuff acts as almost like a tourist attraction. You go, you look at that, and then you go and do the normal exercising. I don't know. Was it a Victorian period? Yes. In terms of geography, for anybody who knows Edinburgh, it's in the, I think it was the King George Park. It's relatively close to the Botanics. And at that point, there was a train station there. So I guess, you know, it it, it was very convenient Look up Royal Patent Gymnasium. It sounds bizarre. There's swings, there's stilts, there's a pond with canoes. It sh e even if it is almost like an attraction, it still, I think, indicates the sort of idea that this type of activity, even if they are doing it as a fun day out, it sort of, it shows how normalised this stuff is, how, how this stuff is just sort of everywhere in Victorian culture. So talking about how exercise and, and the body is, is everywhere in Victorian culture. I do have some interesting facts about some strong men. The guy who is considered to be the epitome of the vaudevillian strongman, Louis Sear. He was inspired by an ancient Olympian wrestler called Milo Proton, who, as part of his training regimen, is said to have eaten 20 pounds of meat, as much bread, and 18 pints of wine every day. And that helped him carry a four-year-old bull around the stadium at Olympia before then eating it throughout the course of the day. Louis ate massive amounts of food and then honed his muscles by pulling heavy carts. Some of his feats of strength included lifting a horse off the ground, lifting a weight of more than 500 pounds with one finger and pushing a train car up a hill. I imagine they're quite exaggerated. I feel like the finger, however muscly and strong you are, your finger still only has a certain amount of strength, surely. Yeah. The most interesting one I found was a guy called Eugene Sando, who became an international celebrity and a sex symbol during the close of the 19th century. Um, he was born in Prussia, started off as a circus athlete and toured Europe. And then he arrived in London in 1889 entered the strongman competition and beat the reigning champion. He was noticed by the curator at the British Museum's Kensington site, which is now the Natural History Museum, Professor Ray Lancaster. Lancaster commissioned a cast of Sandow's physique to put on display in the museum. It was intended to be the first in a series of similar casts to represent perfect body types. The cast took a month to complete. And when it was unveiled at the British Museum in 1901, it was a bit of a flop. People just thought it, that it was unattractive. And it was only on display for three months before it was shuffled into the basement. Victorian society just seems to be quite conflicted <laughs> between mm. being quite Puritan 
And then, you know, as you say, he's a he's a sex symbol. I was reading the sort of the other side of, of all of that, which is the kind of female version, which is in Victorian society, there's a thing called living statues. So the men would be, you know, like Sando doing kind of press ups and weightlifting and things like that. The female equivalent was in music halls, you would get women who would pose sometimes completely naked, but strategically covered with these sort of flesh coloured body stockings or painted, naked but painted. And somehow the fact that they were still was what made it okay. They would pose like a Greek statue or they would pose like a painting and they would literally have a frame around them as they posed. If they'd moved or done things or spoken, somehow that crossed over into pornography or something. But you could go and pay money to sit and watch a naked woman be completely still. And that was just on the acceptable side. For our case study today, we're going to do a deep dive on a topic that Olivia has already touched on, the German bodybuilder, Eugene Sandow. Sandow is a really good example of the sort of fitness and weightlifting craze in Europe in the late 1800s and early 1900s. He performed in the circus, worked as an artist's model, and entered strongman competitions and boxing matches throughout Europe, including Brussels and London, before travelling to America. By that point, he had moved beyond matches and was paid just to pose in front of audiences and demonstrate his weightlifting techniques. He was displayed as an attraction at the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, where his routine involved snapping chains, tearing apart packs of cards and bending bars. Sandow went on to tour all over the United States before visiting South Africa, India, Japan and Australia. At the height of his fame, Sandow was celebrated across the world for his strength and a supposedly perfect physique. He was an early example of a global celebrity. He developed the Sandow brand. He published books and pamphlets, designed and sold exercise equipment such as Sandow spring-loaded dumbbells, and he opened a series of institutes of physical culture where the Sandow brand of exercise, diet and training was taught. Sandow established a monthly magazine and set up his own international bodybuilding competition, which took place in the Royal Albert Hall in London. Alongside himself, one of the other judges was the writer Arthur Conan Doyle. Sandow was the personal physical fitness instructor of King George V, as well as providing training to army recruits. For those who were keen to follow Sandow's technique themselves, but did not have access to the man himself, Kits and instruction manuals could be purchased via mail order. Sandow very intentionally modelled his physique and his aesthetic on Roman and Grecian stylings. Photographs of him in his publications usually show Sandow wearing only a fig leaf or a toga and flexing his muscles. According to one newspaper in 1890, when Sandow began one of his performances, quote, Semi-delirium seized the delighted dames and damsels. Those at the back of the room leapt on the chairs. Tiny palms beat till gloves burst at their wearer's energy. According to Sandow, the women would show their appreciation by throwing jewellery, rings, bracelets, necklaces and brooches onto the stage during his performances. Sandow performed in Edinburgh in 1892. According to contemporary press, 20,000 people came to see him and, quote, his astounding feats have been the subject of universal comment in Edinburgh society. Later in his career, Sandow stopped performing weightlifting feats and began to pose using a specially manufactured lighted posing box. Audiences could pay to come and watch him pose and, for an additional fee, have a private viewing once the other audience members had left. In this short clip, Dr. Kristen Hussey explores William Harvey's book, De Motu Cordis, published in 1628. Uh, Charles Bell is someone I suspect you all know, um, someone who was, uh, finished his life at, began and finished his professional life at the University of Edinburgh. 
Um, and he came to my attention initially as someone who Darwin was very much engaged with in his uh, work on the expression of emotion in man and animals. Um, Bell, as you probably all already know, was a native son of Edinburgh, a surgeon famed for his discoveries about the nervous system. As an artist, but more importantly as a lover of the arts, and also as an impecunious surgeon trying to establish himself as a lecturer in London, uh, he published a book directed at artists setting out to show them the muscular structure and physiology related to emotional expression. This was in 1806. It was entitled The Essays on the Expression, uh, sorry, on the Anatomy of Expression in Painting. It was a huge success. It was widely admired, read by the royal family, um, and adopted by generations of artists, including the Pre-Raphaelites. And Lucy Hartley has uh, written extensively about that. As was to be expected in the historical context of the time, the book did not merely describe emotional expressions, but theorized their purpose, commenting on their supposed universality among all human beings, and discussed the origins of emotional expression. Bell was a religious man, he was an Episcopalian. He was influenced by the kinds of common sense philosophy that were the, those ideas that were flying around Edinburgh at the time. And so as a neurologist, he was embroiled in discussions of the location of the self. The physical location of the soul, spirit, or mind um, had long bedeviled philosophers. Aristotle split it from the sensorium, which he tucked away in the middle of the spine and thought that maybe the soul was in the heart. Descartes put it in the pineal gland, tucked it away in the center of the brain. But Bell founded his theory of the mind in the body and extended it throughout the nervous system, positing that the muscular structure of the body not only expressed the emotions of the self, but enabled them. That is, we are able to have the emotions that we have because of the physiology that we have. Um, and this was kind of a hot potato uh, at the time. It was uh, pretty close to what people thought of as the materialist philosophy coming out of France. So Bell argued that God had designed for humans the body they had precisely in order that all humans would have a common experience. Human emotion was universally legible to other humans because of the physical sympathy experienced by an observer with the expression of the observed. That is, okay, so this is very much the idea of sympathy you see in 18th century philosophy. You look at me and I see that you're in pain and because I would make the same expression if I were in pain, I can intuit what you're feeling, okay? So if you've read Adam Smith, Theory of Moral Sentiments, you know that that's, it's kind of foundational for moral philosophy in the period. So the specific embodiment of the mind was part of divine design, and, and that is the term that is used in this period. The senses did not obscure reality, they enable us to perceive it fully and meaningfully. So Bell believed that humans were divinely gifted, and we might think cursed, with the necessity of involuntarily expressing inner truth through our expressions. Welcome to Recipes of Yore. We're going to explore some unusual medical recipes from the past. The way in which the word recipes was used in the past is a bit different from how it's used today, so it could mean recipes for cooking, for medicine, or even recipes for cleaning products or cosmetics. Very few of them were treatments we would recognise in the 21st century, and certainly none of these should be tried at home. Most recipes relating to the muscles are for very non-specific pains, when the person is sore or strained has a weakness, a spasm, or, or maybe a cramp. One recipe from John Moncrief's Poor Man's Physician for Strains says, quote, First rub the place with salad oil and heart's horn drops. Then wet a flannel cloth with turpentine oil. Bind it pretty tight and let it alone for 12 hours. This must be repeated thrice or oftener if the need require. Turpentine oil is a frequent treatment for muscle complaints, often combined with whiskey. Another common recommendation was to sit before a rousing fire. A lot of the recipes actually are based around being warming, comforting and relaxing. Another from the same text, for sore muscles this time, recommends, quote, wax and swine's grease made plaster ways and applied to the part afflicted. Then drink five cups of green tea, pretty strong, and a little pepper in each cup instead of sugar. 
Other treatments for muscle pain included powdered gold, chocolate, and a cooked mixture of milk, flour, eggs, and butter, which actually sounds quite a lot like a recipe for pancakes. Thank you for listening to this Case Notes podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, click like, or leave a positive review or comment. We really appreciate it because it helps us get higher in the rankings and reach more people. Thank you.